next concept for us to explain is the summation of force. And again, some one of those words you read and you think, oh, this is going to be a bit over my head. Once you break it down, it's actually quite straightforward. It's the sum of forces. So the total amount of separate forces added together. Um, so we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail. But the summation of force, um, the objective is to maximize the velocity of a thrown or kicked ball and involve a complex coordination of a series of individual mov movements at a number of different joints in the human body. Okay, so instead of providing the force by, say, a leg when jumping, if you jump and, and also add the force provided by your arms propelling in that uh, direction and your hips propelling and your chest propelling in that direction, the sum of all those body parts is your summation of force. Are you going to be able to create more force using more body parts when compared to just the leg? Yes, of course you are because you've increased your summation of force. So there's two ways in which you can do that, but it's all about the correct timing and sequencing of body segments, muscles through a range of motion. So the first way that that can be achieved is by simultaneously moving every muscle or joint at the same time. Okay? So think of, like this picture demonstrates, a high jump takeoff, a gymnastics vault takeoff. Okay? They propel every part of their body in that direction at the exact same time, so simultaneously. Okay? So that allows them to generate maximum force. That The summation of force will be greater through their whole body rather than just through their legs. Okay, so again, long jump is another example of simultaneous force, okay, or summation of force simultaneously, okay. As he jumps off that mat, he throws his arms up, he throws his knees up, he throws his feet up, okay. He's trying to propel everything. He uses everything. So the summation of force is bigger because he's involving more body parts. So that allows him to generate more force because it's not just the force by his legs, it's the force by his legs, his arms, his upper body, everything. So that gender allows more force to be created. So he's increased his summation by force by adding in more parts. Okay? So the other method that this can be achieved is by sequentially. So in sequence, not all at the same time but one body part to the next, to the next, to the next, and transferring the momentum of force between those body parts in order to generate even more force, okay? So, moved in a sequence to generate greater force. So, kicking for distance. You don't just kick with, the, with your ankle and your lower leg, right? They drive through... Um, and their leg often goes over their head to involve their whole upper leg, okay? So that involves a bit of sequencing and coordination of different muscles in particular order and time in order to generate a maximum amount of force. Momentum is generated in larger, slower body segments and it eventually gets transferred to small lighter fast moving segments and then eventually transferred to an object so in the case of the punter that we said before it starts with big body muscles such as your quadriceps and your hips okay then eventually it moves into smaller uh muscle groups like your lower leg okay your calf your um tib bib Okay, then it goes to your foot and your toe at the point of contact and all of that momentum that has been created through all those body parts is then transferred to the ball, okay, allowing it to, to increase its speed and velocity. So if you can increase your summation of momentum or force summation, then you can increase the velocity of which a ball is released and therefore the distance that that ball travels, okay? So 
how do you do this? What is the sort of sequential force summation method? Well, it starts by activating the stronger and larger muscle groups first. Okay? So in order to generate as much force, you should start with the larger muscle group. Okay? Then they use as many body parts as possible. The more body parts that are working together to generate this force, the more force you're going to be able to generate. Okay, and it's also important to try and generate that over a greater period of time. If there's more time to apply that force, you've increased the impulse of that force, okay, which is force over time. If you're applying the force for five seconds instead of three seconds, that's two seconds more of force that's been applied. So you're going to get more out of it. The summation is going to be more. Okay, so firstly, you're activating the stronger and larger muscle groups. Secondly, you're going to try and use as many body parts as possible, um, which enables the force to be generated over a greater period of time. You're going to transfer the momentum from one body part to another when it's at its maximal velocity. So it's about timing. You know, that timing has to be spot on. And um, You need a stable base of support. So on the ground, there must be a stable base um, which, which will give you the stability in order to generate and concentrate on all these other movements um, and make sure that they're happening at maximum velocity, okay? And lastly, you need to ensure an appropriate follow-through is used um, to prevent injury because if you're just passing all of that momentum and then suddenly stopping, that is the recipe for an injury, okay? That's how hamstrings get done. So there needs to be a deceleration part of the momentum. So rather than the momentum just ending very abruptly, it should gradually end, which is what we call decelerating the impulse. Okay? So, this has got to do with the timing. Now, this is one of those things that you can look at and go, what does this mean? This looks so confusing. I guarantee you're gonna understand it within one minute, okay? So basically, as we go higher, up this table, okay, as it increases vertically, all right, the amount of force is increasing. So if you look at the two lately timed combination of body, arm, and forearm, I should say summation of body, arm, and forearm, when it was timed too late, okay, it only released that amount of force. When it was timed too early, it's marginally more, okay. When it was well timed, okay, then it was able to create the most force. The summation of force was higher when the body parts were able to transfer their momentum from one to the other perfectly timed. How do we know it's perfectly timed? Well, it's very simple. If you have a look at these bodies, the very peak of this arch, okay, that is the perfect time to transfer the momentum. When it's at its absolute peak, that's the perfect time. Okay, as you can see, this has gone over the peak. Okay, so the timing was a bit too late. They transferred the momentum a little bit too late. Again, with the arm, the peak is right here, but they transferred again a little bit too late. Okay, and the forearm is the last one of the three, but as you can see, it's not as high. Okay, when you're looking at the two early. You can see the peak is right here, but it's been transferred to the arm from the body too early before its peak. Okay, so the maximum amount of force wasn't passed on from body to arm. Okay, near maximum, but as you can see, it makes a difference when compared to the well time one. And when you can see, look at this well time, okay, you've got the body and it's right at the, at the launch point of that peak where it's transferred to the arm. And again, on the forearm is is still a little bit above peak if I'm going to be perfectly honest um, in front of peak but you can still see the maximum growth that come from being as close to that peak as possible and basically what this is saying is if you can get the timing of the summation of force right when the when the momentum is transferred from one body part to the next if you can get that timing right you're going to generate maximal force, okay? And it always starts with the bigger body parts, okay, and transfers to eventually the small body part 
and then eventually to the object in which you're trying to pass that force over to, whether it be a golf ball, etc. So you may remember this practical that we did. Okay, the first throw, and this is about being able to use more and more body parts. The first throw, you can lie on the ground and throw the ball as far as you can whilst keeping all other body parts except the throwing arm flat on the ground. So the idea being there that you are only allowed to move one body part, the arm. Okay, you measure the distance. The second one, you're in a sitting position, and that's going to naturally mean you can do a little bit of rotation of your trunk, okay, and use your shoulder a little bit more. The third one, you're standing up now with your feet firmly planted on the ground. Okay, both are facing forwards, so you're not quite able to rotate as much. Okay, but you still are able to involve a lot more body movement than the previous two throws. And the last one, it's a free for all. You have a five metre run up and you get to throw the ball as far forward as possible. So when you record the results, naturally, you're going to get a further result. In throw four consistently. I'd be very surprised if that was not the case with your uh, experiment. Okay. And why is that? Well, it's got to do with the summation of force. More body parts were involved. So, therefore, more force was generated. So, which throw to cover the most distance? It should be throw four. Why was the ball traveled different distances for each throw? Use the principles of force summation to assist you. So, I hope you can pause that and be able to write a confident answer after having gone through this video, okay? But basically, um, why is the ball traveled furthest? Well, in the, in the uh, throw four, you are able to start with the big muscle groups, okay? First and foremost, you can start with the, by activating the large muscle groups of the trunk and the body, okay, your hips, and then you can gradually pass that momentum down to the smaller muscle groups and eventually to the ball on which you've thrown. Okay, so sequential force summation has occurred in you being able to throw that. Okay, and because you've had a run-up, there's also momentum of your entire body, so the linear momentum that your, your body is creating by moving. Okay, that has also been passed on to the ball. So young children often throw using their arm Outline three teaching points you could use when teaching them to throw correctly. Well, very simply, you'd be looking at teaching them these teaching points here. Activating the stronger and larger muscles first. Use as many body parts as possible, which enables force to be generated over a greater period of time. The timing um, is important, okay? You want to transfer the momentum from one part to another when it's at its maximum peak, okay? Um, and you need a stable base of support, okay? So any of those things would have been acceptable in that last question. That is for summation, okay? Let's sum it up right here. To gain maximum momentum, the force needs to be generated by using as many segments as the body as possible in the correct sequence, using the large muscles first and then the smaller muscles last, but they will be operating the fastest because they've got all that other force behind them with the correct timing and through the greatest range of motion. If the range of motion that you're moving through is greater, you are going to be generating more force. So that is force summation. I hope that makes sense. Here are some other examples. I strongly suggest you go and have a look.